Good afternoon and uh, welcome to St Margaret's on this International Women's Day. We're very grateful to Aberdeen Standard Capital for supporting this series of events and today we're absolutely delighted to welcome Dr Nicola Steedman who must surely be one of the busiest women in the country right now. We're so grateful to you Dr Steedman for taking the time out um, to talk to us this afternoon. Thank you very much. I am absolutely delighted to be here. I really am. It's it's an honour and a privilege to even be asked to speak and you know at a, an event such as this. Um, I think the first thing I'd want to say is that I'm not sure that I'd ever want to feel qualified to give life and, and career advice to a group of young women with such amazing potential and such fantastic lives ahead of them. Um, but part of my not feeling as if I'm equipped to give anybody advice, I think is is one of the things that, that we women tend to find, which is that we all, or many of us, suffer from what we now know is called imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've ever heard about this, but certainly um, this is something that uh, that I felt a little bit better about when the the previous chief medical officer from, from England, uh, Sally Davies, uh, claimed this for herself. And that's, I think, made many of us who have felt that uh, own it over the years. And this is feeling as if you're somehow masquerading in a successful life and that someone's going to find out that you shouldn't really be there. Um, and this is something that for some reason is particularly common in women. Um, and most of us feel that way. So I suppose it's it's to open up by, by saying that uh, I think that's a trait that's particularly common in women. Men tend to have a bit more uh, belief in themselves, let's put it that way, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse than women. And this is one of the things I'd really like to see us us change for us as, as as women who are currently leaders and leaders of the future. Oh, well, thank you for being so honest. And that's just a great start, isn't it, to um, this afternoon's time together. I see Jules smiling and nodding um, here. Jules, one of our sixth year pupils. And uh, I know Jules got some questions of her own to ask you um, in a little while. But I would just say to everybody who's watching from home, um, do feel free to use the webinar function to submit any questions. Dr. Stephen and I have been chatting already this afternoon and she's really stressed to me how, you know, she's very, very keen to um, answer our questions. So don't hold back and um, do submit them. But I wonder whether just to, to get started, we might ask you just to give us a little bit of a, an overview of your career to date, the journey you've been on, because we just really love to hear about that. Yeah, certainly. You know me, I can I can talk for 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 Ireland, literally at, at this rate. Um, it's funny because when I uh, thought about doing this this session with you, I thought to myself, "Gosh, what you know? What did I get from my time when I was when I was at school?" And mm -hmm. I went to school back in in Belfast, which is where all my family are from, and which is where I grew up. And in fact, it's where all of my family still are. Um, so mm -hmm. I haven't seen them, in fact, in 18 mm -hmm. months over the pandemic, unfortunately, and I miss them desperately. But um, but one of the things that I did really get from school, which I, I am quite sure that the girls will identify with, is that that feeling. Um, my school was a very old one um, and uh, I had a sense of history in it. I had a sense of passing through where many people had passed through before me and gone on to do things in life. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a sense of being part of something that was, you know, that was much greater than just me as one little person. I was I was part of a kind of bigger, bigger picture for something. And I think what that really did instill in me is, you know, a sense of humility. You know, mm -hmm. I am I am one little person. Um, and and that is is not a bad thing to take with you through your career. It's just a sense of um, self-awareness and and humility. And that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have confidence in yourself, because that's the thing that I'm going to try to get across to all of you during this evening is believe in yourself. But always just have that that humility, that that realization that you're you're not the only person or the only thing in the universe, and that there are other things uh, that you you know that you should also invest your time and energy looking after as you go through your career. And I'll come back to that. So I think the other thing that I got whenever I was at school was that I 
I felt like school was a, a place of safety and a place of protection. Mm -hmm. When I went through the walls of my school, you know, I I felt as if that was that was a place where people looked after me, um, and the teachers knew everything. You know, teachers never <laughs> didn't know the answer to something, which was just absolutely staggering and, and really inspiring. So I think what I'd say to, you know, to all of you at the moment is to take advantage of where you are now in your life in terms of the fact that you're young, you're full of potential, your minds, your brains are the most active they'll ever be. And you're in a safe place to learn, whether that be virtually at the moment and being looked after very well by your parents and your teachers and your headmistress, or whether it be when you're back in the school building. But take advantage of that really safe place to learn and develop and ask questions where you're in a supportive yeah. environment and a safe environment to do it. Don't be afraid. The, the theme of International Women's Day today is choose to challenge. So do challenge, ask questions, learn, develop while you can. Because believe me, by the time your brain gets to be as old as mine, things don't go in as easily, <laughs> let me tell you. So put as much in as you can before it all starts falling out of your ears again when you when you get to a certain stage in your life. But in all seriousness, you know, just try to make the most of the, the fantastic opportunities that you have while you're there. I know that that I certainly did and I don't regret it. And a couple of years back, in fact, I um, attended my own old school for a prize giving um, because my niece was receiving a prize back in <laughs> Belfast and they invited me to come and, and speak at the school. And I'll tell you something, girls, you never stop feeling like a pupil. When I went back, I was terrified. <laughs> Honestly, I, and I met some of my old teachers. I was practically curtsying in front of them. I was absolutely terrified again. So, you, you know, you, you always feel as if you're a, a schoolgirl whenever you go back to school. But one of the things I did notice um, when they were doing the prize giving was that at my old school, they now have prizes not just for top marks in maths or top marks in physics mm -hmm. or, you know, art or whatever, but they actually had prizes for courage, for effort and for endeavour. And I'm going to come back to those because I think I'm going to leave you with those three really important qualities that I think will see you through whatever you decide to do with your life. And that's to have courage and hard work, effort and endeavour. Always try and always do your best. And believe me, you will not go far wrong with that. So in terms of my career, I mean, I've been incredibly lucky. I really have. Although my dad says to me, um, the harder you work, the luckier you become, which in his case is certainly true because he worked really, really hard and neither of my parents went to university. So it was a really big thing for them when I went to university. Um, and I think the other thing that stood me in good stead at university was um, school taught me how to work and school taught me the value of work so that when I went to university then and I was left kind of on my own to do my own work, I was in a better position um, and I was really lucky because I got to go to Cambridge to do my undergraduate training and then to Oxford to do my medical training but as I say you know my mum and dad hadn't been to university so this was a big deal I was very lucky to get there you know and very lucky to be offered the place and I nearly didn't take it because I was so utterly terrified of, of leaving home, believe it or not. Yeah. So, you know, it was a big deal and it felt because I would have to move away and, you know, coming from Ireland, I would have to go across the water. And it just felt like a lot for someone who was was 18 yeah. and who'd, you know, been looked after very closely by her Irish mother for those 18 years. Um, <laughs> but um but I did go, and that will be something else again that I'll come back to, which is about taking chances and taking good opportunities whenever they come up. So I was very lucky to be able to, to train where I did, but I must say I found it hard at university at the beginning. So I think that's the other thing I'd say is it's again, it's about that endeavor. Don't give up just because something seems to be hard. I did, did find, find it difficult. About it? Yeah, so I think the, the absolute independence was daunting mm -hmm. okay. when you're <laughs> used to people always being there to kind of make sure you're okay and to tell you um, what um, to do almost. And then to have that feeling of, um, you know, unparalleled choices that you have to make for yourself all of a sudden just felt a little bit overwhelming, I think, for mm -hmm. me. And also mm -hmm. the fact that. Um, you then have you know a lot of uh more difficult work and the volume of work that is a step up from school 
and yeah. you you don't quite know what to expect and again i think sometimes you know you doubt your own ability really when you're put into that environment where uh where you suddenly have to make that step up intellectually and that together with being away from home in my case you know was quite a big life change i think um but what i would say is don't be afraid because it's an absolutely wonderful formative time when i look back now and when I look back over that period of time, it's probably the most important period of my life in terms of who I became. It made me who I am in so many respects. And yes, I found maybe the first year difficult, but not unmanageable, just, just mm-hmm. challenging. And mm-hmm. that is a good thing because when I came out the other side of that, I knew that even if I came across challenges in life, that things felt difficult sometimes, that I could cope and that I would be all right and that everything didn't have to be smooth sailing for me to be able to to enjoy it in the end and to get things that are really valuable from it. So um, I'd say throw yourself into opportunities whenever they present, embrace the unexpected. It's kind of feel the fear and do it anyway, as the title of the book is, (laughs) because you will be fine and you are capable of much more than you know. And we were talking before this began, and it's this combination in life of both triumphs and successes, but also challenges that make you who you are. So even events that feel difficult do something to you as a person that makes you stronger. They do. And they may feel at the time as if you would rather be anywhere else than in that situation. But when you come out the other side, something in you has changed and you are stronger. You are better for it. And I I speak from my own experience there. So don't be afraid of hard things. Don't be afraid of hard times. Life for everyone has its ups and downs. And that's part and parcel of what makes you the person that you are and the strong person that you are. It's not the same. I'm telling you, if you just go through your life with no challenges and nobody does no matter what you see on Instagram or Twitter that's the other thing nobody goes through without any challenges so the rest of my career after university um a lot of it was lost in a blur of sleepless nights um which thankfully sure. I think medicine, medicine has changed which is good because it was as you've heard in the in the bad old days for me with you know many many really you know very very physically i think difficult Mm -hmm. um challenges um and that has changed very much for the better um and i think i think as well you know medicine in particular is such a privilege because any any place where you're working with other people where you're working in the public sector Mm -hmm. you're working with other people about things that matter to them and in medicine in particular you're working with people when they're sick they're at their most vulnerable Mm -hmm. you are there to help them if you possibly can it is the biggest privilege to be in that position and that doesn't mean that it isn't hard because you see things that you can never unsee you are in difficult situations Mm -hmm. But I always, always come back to the fact that it is a genuine privilege to work with other people and be there when people need you. And (laughs) you can see I'm a public sector girl at heart. Um, And one of the things actually that I'll quote for you, I think it was Jen Jen Welter, who was the the NFL's first female coach, would you believe? You're thinking, where is she going with this? Um, But her, her quote was, if you want to be successful, follow your passion not the paycheck and i would say that too i would say do what you what you love do what makes your heart beat faster do what means something to you um and that will that will sustain you uh and it's not about chasing chasing the highest salary it's about doing something that that makes you feel something that really speaks to you uh and 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 i could never say that is not the case about medicine, however difficult it's been. And and my medical career after sort of house jobs and and blurred sleepless nights, I went back to Cambridge at that point actually, and I did four years of research. We believe in a lab. I sat in a lab with my little white coat on and my Petri shoes into me and I did HIV research, which was tremendous. Mm -hmm. And I did some lecturing as well at, at Cambridge. And then I became a consultant in a hospital in um, genitourinary and HIV medicine. So in fact, 
um, sexually transmitted diseases, um, sexual health and contraception, but also HIV. Uh, and I spent a number of years consultant working in a hospital in that specialty before um, that was actually in England. And then I came back to what I call my spiritual home of Scotland um, <laughs> to, uh, to take up a post in Scottish government. And the post that I took up at that point was a senior medical officer, which was advising the ministers on, on various aspects of, of public health. And that was the first time I'd, I'd been in government. So that, again, that was a real baptism of fire. Um, and I did that, as I say, for a number of years. Absolutely loved it. It's an incredibly challenging job and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a really interesting one as well. Um, and I actually left Scottish government in 2019 to be a medical director in one of the specialist NHS boards in, in Scotland, NSS. And I was overseeing all of the very specialist services for Scotland. So everything that is to do with rare conditions. And then Scottish government asked me to come back last April to be interim deputy chief medical officer. Uh, and that was an incredibly uh, exhilarating and exhausting and really uh you know incredibly humbling position in which to be at the time when we're facing a global mm -hmm. pandemic and i mm -hmm. don't take that for granted i take my role very very seriously um mm -hmm. and i feel very fortunate to to be in this position i really do um but it's 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 not an easy path as as you can imagine but then i don't take easy easy pathways so i think probably what you'll see from my career is that I've had a portfolio career. Mm -hmm. So I haven't followed necessarily a traditional pathway for someone mm -hmm. who has, has done medicine. Um, and my path has taken many twists and turns. So again, all of that has felt right to me at the time. So that's another message, I think, is to know yourself, to trust your gut about what is right for you. And when opportunities come up, look at them very hard and listen to what your gut is telling you and, and follow your own pathway. So don't follow the herd, do what is right for you. And you are the person who will know best what is right for you because you're the person who knows you best. Mm -hmm. So there's probably a few other kind of messages that I'd say about my career along the way that are a bit more general than just medicine, which you know might be useful. And uh, I think one of those as well is, if you're too comfortable in something, move on, because we all need to challenge ourselves. So if you're not feeling challenged, if you're feeling as if you're you know cruising in something, um, challenge yourself, you know, mix it up a bit, do something a little bit different, move on, don't, don't stagnate fulfill your potential because you're capable of probably even more than you know and don't be afraid to step out of your comfort zone and take the occasional well calculated and good risk don't be afraid to step outside that comfort zone um opportunities don't make appointments as the saying goes so when they come along just look at them there and then and trust me eventually your gut will tell you what the right thing is to do the other thing i needed to tell you is that perfection does not exist okay it's a complete utter fallacy in everything the pursuit of perfection and i speak from painful experience as a perfectionist <laughs> the pursuit of effect of perfection is absolutely destructive you will drive yourself into a frenzy humanity is fallibility we are not perfect my life is not perfect my career is not perfect none of us are and that's one of the wonderful things that makes us humans please do not feel that you have to be perfect how boring is perfect it's the bits of me that are a slight hazard that i think are probably some of my most endearing qualities or that's what my husband tells me anyway so don't don't pursue perfection um and please please be kind to yourselves i hear young girls i hear my nieces these days and they're 19 and 21 now and I hear how hard they are on themselves. And honestly, it makes me want to, mm -hmm. um, you know, treat yourself as you would treat your best friend. If you hear yourself saying something in your own head, putting yourself down, think to yourself, if that was my best friend saying that to me about herself, what would I say back to her? 
you know, would I say, yes, you're right, you're absolutely rubbish? Or would I say, don't be so ridiculous? You know, you're not seeing this straight. You're not seeing it clearly. You are a wonderful person. You are doing your best. You've done a fantastic job. Please speak to yourself with kindness the way you would to one of your best friends. And be kind to other people as you go through your career. You do not have to step on other people's toes. You do not have to shove other people out of the way to be successful. You can be kind and good hearted and still have a very successful career. And again, I speak from experience there. Um, and your headmistress better cover her ears here at this time when I go out on a limb and say, go for it. Someone, another person, someone will not complete you or make you happy. If you think there is that one person out there, that one guy or that one girl who's mm -hmm. going to make you happy, that is not the way it works. Mm -hmm. Do not settle for anything other than someone who loves you for who you are, all that you are, all the bits and pieces. And also don't be a rush to settle down with anybody. And again, I mean that. Um, <laughs> and I'm married, so I'm allowed to say that. But I didn't get married until my 30s. And I was, I tell you what, I wasn't in a rush either. I wasn't looking to get married. I just got, you know, I came across the right person and it was the right time. And I'm glad I didn't do it earlier because I had so much of my life to live and enjoy. <laughs> but um, the the person who who wants you, so whether it be the guy that you want or the girl that you want, let me tell you, independence, having your own career, Doing your own thing, having your own mind is a very attractive quality. So that's the other thing. If you cultivate that in yourself, trust me, the boys and the girls will come running. So you can uncover your ears now, okay, Mr. I've done my bit on relationship talk, which is about as far as I get. Um, but having said that, don't, um, don't go through your life alone either. If you need help from people and support, please do ask for it. Don't sit and suffer in silence. You know, turn to your family and your friends and your colleagues. Don't mm -hmm. take everything on yourself and don't develop that hero mm -hmm. complex. Um, knowing your limits and being honest about what you need are strengths. That is true, true confidence is to be able to state what you want and what you need. And sometimes that is that you need someone else to help or you need someone else to do something or that you need a break. So please remember, it's not weakness, it's confidence. It's assertiveness. It's looking after yourself. So ask for help if you need it. Finally, I think I'll just finish by saying, um, would I say do what I do? Uh, no, I would say do what you do. <laughs> so <laughs> pick and choose from all the things that you'll hear from women, believe me, far more inspirational than me. And fit it round for what suits you. The things that have helped me sense of humour, as you'll have gathered. I've laughed my way through many an inappropriate situation and it really has helped rather than shouting. Um, professionalism. So always, always uh, remember that you are, um, in my case, dealing with the public and therefore you have a job to do, you have a role to fulfil and you won't find me shouting at anybody or, um, you know, uh, crying at anybody in a situation where I am supposed to be doing my job to help that person. So professionalism, remember the role that you're in, whatever it is, and, and, and hold that bit of you front and center. I take real pride in that. And always be reliable, always be dedicated, be the person that everybody knows that you work hard and that you'll get something done if you say you'll get it done. That that Those kinds of real core qualities are what people are looking for. And be honest and just care about people. Because again, we're all humans and that will that will get you pretty far. So courage, endeavor, and effort. You thought I'd forgotten, but I'm back around a full circle um, to where I started, which I think are the you know the three main qualities. So you, uh, that's more than a potted history. 
That was great. I can can see everybody who's watching this smiling um, in their own homes and and, and feeling inspired. And I think, um, you know, you talked about imposter imposter syndrome and telling us that there'll be other women out there who are more inspirational. I think you've just hit so many things there um, in, in such a short space of time. Um, and you know we're, we're so grateful that you're willing to be so open and so generous with your with your thoughts and you know and actually about the whole person because that, that matters so much this isn't just about um, you know us talking about which careers our pupils might pursue but it's about being happy settled whole people um, as, as they go into life and as we as adults you know progress um, in our lives so you, you've just given us a great start there thank you so much and I could see Jewel nodding and smiling um, just as I was. And um, I mean, there are questions coming in um, very quickly, I have to say, um, from the, the audience. But I know, Jewel, you've got one or two questions you'd like to kick off with. So perhaps we'll hand over to Jewel now and you can ask Dr. Steedman a couple of your questions. Thank you, Dr. Steedman, for that. It was really invaluable to hear about your experience. So the first question I have is that, Having studied at two of the most prestigious universities, both Cambridge and Oxford respectively, and graduating with a first class medical sciences degree and a medicine (laughs) is incredibly inspirational and something that definitely requires immense hard work and motivation. What motivated and still motivates you to work this hard? Oh, wow. That's an incredibly good question, isn't it? Um, I've always, always um worked incredibly hard um ever since i i was little um i think there's you know there's any number of reasons why that might be the case um some of which are probably more um you know more more helpful than others i think i learned very quickly when i was little that um that that hard work paid off um as i say my dad was um was was always very good at 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 teaching me that um, effort will often trump um, the smarts, if you like, and Mm -hmm. that ability can be learned and that you can be as intelligent as you want and as bright as you want, but if you don't apply yourself and don't put the work in, that you won't get anywhere. Whereas, you know, if you put enough effort into something, you can actually achieve most things. So I, I think I grew up with a, you know, a, a very, a very good um, work ethic. There is that bit of me, if we're being honest, as I say, that is the perfectionist that always wanted to, you know, to, to do the very best that they could. And I say that in the spirit of honesty, because that is a helpful characteristic to a certain extent, because it allows you to be, you know, really dedicated at what you do. But as I've said to you, and I do think this is really important, you need to know where that where that you know sort of limit is, and that perfection is not achievable. So that's a you know that's a personal thing I've had to learn for the years mm-hmm. and and adapt to. So there is something about my personality that just always wants to do the very very best that they can, um, and that's actually something that that needs checking and needs just just watching occasionally mm-hmm. um but i think it's it's also about uh some of the rewards i think that that you get from um uh, achieving things and i think it's about um feeling that you're making the best of yourself and the best of your life mm-hmm. i think we owe ourselves um a, you know a duty to fulfill our potential whatever that potential is So again, that's not setting a bar that everyone has to reach, but it's saying be the best that you can be. Um, And uh, both my parents have always been been very good at saying to us, if you've tried your best and worked your hardest, then I am proud of you. It's not just about what you achieve, it's how you go about it. And I really do stand by that and i as i say i have been fortunate in that i've i've done very well if it's any consolation i'm terrible at some things that's the i suppose that's the other important thing to be honest about my driving instructor um once told me he sat down and said you know nicola there are some people who are really good at passing exams and then there are other people who are good at driving and (laughs) and i said i think i know what you're trying to tell me and he's right you know so 
I have been very successful in certain things. I've played to my strengths, but I'm not perfect. I'm not good at everything. Play to your strengths would probably be the other thing I would say. <laughs> Great. So another question I would like to ask is, you've had a really successful career, but how do you think being a woman has impacted your career? Yeah, so I think it, I think it certainly has. Um, I am someone who uh, has always been very proud of being a woman. Um, I went to an all girls school, which I'll be honest, I think, uh, you know, was was a very good environment for me to flourish in. Uh, I had all my friends around me. I, I, I didn't have any distractions of, you know, wondering a, about what boys might have thought of me in school. And um, and I can only speak from a personal point of view and say that mm -hmm. I think for me, that was a really good thing um, mm -hmm. because it allowed me just to concentrate in school on on, on doing the work. Um, and you know, I I think that also meant that by the time I left school, I had confidence in in me as a as a woman, and I have always been a girly girl. So I think that's the other thing you can probably tell by the fact that I still get up every day and I put my makeup on and I love my nice dresses and I have a thing about lovely shoes. Um, you know, and and I am a very girly girl, and uh, in some respects, that as I've gone through my career means that people have occasionally underestimated me because they've looked at me and thought she's just you know she's thinking more about her eyeliner than than what's going on in the science world and that's actually been to my advantage because i've just proved them wrong by my actions so i am almost a sort of a, a wolf in in uh you know in fancy clothing in that respect um i i do my Kind of you know my appearance my pride in my appearance for me as a professional to look my best to feel my best is part and parcel of making the best of me and i don't apologize for that but if anything i'm the kind of poster girl for saying you know you can do that if that's what you want to do you can wear your makeup and and your fancy shoes and you can still be a really scary and formidable brain underneath all that and that's fine you know, and you don't have to conform to anyone's stereotype of what they believe a successful woman should be. So again, it's not saying do that. It's saying do what is right for you. And that has always felt right for me along the way. As I say, it does mean that, you know, you come across sexism um, as, as you go through uh, your career. I certainly have had that. I've had, mm -hmm. um, consultants when I was a medical student who told me that there was no point teaching me because I would just go off and have babies anyway and waste all that education um, you know and and um, other people as I've gone through my career who've, who've looked at me and the, the consultants used to have a, a game of guessing what specialty somebody would go into you know and they would say oh well she's wearing a lovely floral dress or whatever so she's clearly you know going to be whatever you know whatever the the they thought was the the specialty of the day she's going to be a general practitioner and she's going to work one day a week because she knows she's going to be shopping the rest of the time i've had all of that and i have i have quietly laughed my way through it gone my own way and uh and pretty much ignored it so i think have that um have that steel within yourself have that confidence within yourself you will come across bias we all come across bias it isn't just related to gender either. You know, mm -hmm. there'll always be something about you that someone somewhere doesn't like. Um, and sometimes it will be conscious and sometimes they won't even know that they're displaying bias. It will be unconscious. So I try to, to rise above this to, you know, to just do my own thing, um, which is really funny because if I saw it happening to someone else, I would verbally challenge it. You know, I would just speak up straight away. And yet when it happens to me, I prefer to just be a little bit more subversive about it and just basically to prove things through my actions. Um, and that, that, as I say, has, you know, has worked for me. Often as well, if I want to highlight sexism, if I see it happening, I will do it with humor rather than confrontationally call someone out. I'll make a joke about it, um, you know, so that, uh, so that they know that they've been caught on it, but, that um you know i've pointed it out in a way that 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 doesn't make someone feel incredibly defensive 
uh, because as I say, sometimes it happens and people aren't even aware that they're doing it. Mm -hmm. So I think actually being a woman for me has um, has worked in, in my favor. I love being a woman. I love being a woman in science and medicine. Um, I love working with other women and I love working with men. You know, I, I just um, kind of get on with it and, and, and like being who I am. Uh, so it's not always, um, you know, a disadvantage. It can often be a, as long as you are you are just confident in, in who you are and and as I say you play to your talents and play to your play to your strengths. Never a quick answer with me. <laughs> Fascinating answers though. Is it my turn, Jill? I think yeah, I'll have, I'll have a go. I'll, I'll pick up one of the questions that's just um, come through and um, this is obviously somebody who's really interested in your, your role with the government. It says, how do you balance your time between frontline healthcare and the government um, policy or advice work, which goes with being the deputy chief medical officer? Mm, yeah, very good question. Um, this comes down to a sort of a general point of you can never do everything and you, 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 you often can't do all of the things that you want to do. Uh, so at the moment for example i am not doing my clinical work and i haven't done my clinical work since i took up the interim deputy chief medical officer yeah. post and that's purely actually because we're not doing face-to-face -face clinical work at the moment anyway it's it's remote um <laughs> and so uh it seemed um like the opportunity to just uh to concentrate on the the deputy chief medical officer role for a, for a period of time but up until last April I was still doing clinical work and what I did whenever I came back to Scottish government as a senior medical officer after being a consultant for many years I um, I made sure that before I accepted the post that Scottish government were happy with me continuing my clinical work for the mm -hmm. period of a day a week and that was part and parcel of me you know wanting to take up the the job and they were very supportive of that uh, and, and allowed me to do that. And I still have that honorary contract with, with Lothian to take up again. But one of the things that I did have to do then was to be honest with myself and say, well, look, I can't be a full-time hands-on <laughs> clinician and a person who does a full-time national job in advising and in public health. So I have to make some choices here. So if you'll remember, I actually um, qualified in genitourinary medicine and <laughs> HIV, but what I did was when I cut down my clinical work, I focused purely on HIV. So I, uh, I only did HIV to allow myself that um, ability to not have to do absolutely everything because that was never going to work. And the other thing that I promised myself when I continued my clinical work was that I would continue to get um, all of the appropriate revalidation and feedback from my patients and feedback from my colleagues. And if I ever felt, and anyone else ever felt, that I was de-skilling in mm -hmm. respect mm -hmm. and not giving my patients the absolute gold standard 100% care that they could expect from, from anyone doing that job full time, that I would stop doing it and I would step back. In other words, it wasn't about me, it was about the patients. I wanted to continue seeing them. I love clinical work, but I would never do it just because it makes me feel good. It has to be what's right for the, for the patients. So it is possible to do both. I know many people who do a part-time clinical career and something else in the other part, whether it be research or um, other kinds of academia, education, or whether it be national work but uh, be very clear about the amount of time that you have to spend on each bit and don't get yourself into two full-time jobs in the space of one. And also, uh, again, be very, um, very vigilant and very ruthless with yourself about making sure that you are continuing to do those parts of those jobs to the level that they should be done mm -hmm. and step back if they're not. But it is entirely mm -hmm. possible to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. That's great. Jill, back to you. OK, I have another question, and this is more about your role as interim deputy chief a medical officer. So as you have to communicate with the public a lot, what is the key to success when communicating with the public? 
and how do you manage to convince the public to take your advice on board on relevant topics such as the benefits of receiving the COVID-19 vaccine, for example? So I won't pretend that I know all the answers and that I think I'm a perfect communicator. So that's the first thing to say. Uh, so what I'll what I'll say is what what I think and what I believe. But I am painfully aware that we all always have more to learn, and no one has more to learn than me in terms of um you know how to how to communicate better with people. It's it's you know it's it's a lifetime um, endeavor. It really is, and you can always get better at it. Um, the first thing I'd say is I think be yourself. People can sense if you are not genuine, if you are putting on a complete front and trying to be someone that you're not. So that I could be much more um, formal. I could be much more reserved probably than, than I am, but that's not me. I am in many respects hard on my sleeve, um, you know, try to give people as much information as possible, try to be honest. And I think that people sense when you are being genuine. Uh, so just you know be yourself absolutely um i try to uh speak about um things that i i know as a person not just as an intellect or a scientist so i try to talk about um you know experiences that have happened to me for example or my patients um or my family so mm -hmm. again i try to make it uh you know a a connection with the public that they will understand so that they don't just see me as someone that they can't identify with and someone who doesn't understand their situation or or their life so i, I try very hard not to make it so detached as well and scientific that human feelings and relationships mm -hmm. don't come into it so for me how people feel about things what people experience is you know is is desperately important to all of us and and that's what i try to you know to get across that i do understand what people are saying and despite what you might think after mm -hmm. this session in other circumstances which are not so much the press briefings i try to listen mm -hmm. to what people are telling me mm -hmm. and i do try to give them a chance to tell me what they're thinking as opposed to me just mm -hmm. talking at them. So I think always being willing to take on what other people have to say and and, and their thoughts and, and views will, will make you a much better communicator than just everything that is coming out of your head alone. Um, but having said that, I think um, I am quite sure that, you know, I, I, I don't reach everybody and um, nobody can you you know you yeah. do again you do your very very best with everything that you have in your armory and don't ever think that you're the only person who can do it that's the other thing i think there will be some other individuals in specific circumstances who are maybe a better person to communicate in that particular circumstance so uh so again you know know your audience and know what it is that that someone's looking for in a particular circumstance and be honest as well about saying is that me so when i'm asked to do anything in the media sense um i often say to our communications colleagues um if you think that i am the best person to do this then i'm very happy to do it and if you don't think i'm the best person to do it i'm not precious about it someone else should do it because it's more important that someone gets yeah. the right message across so mm -hmm. it's not about me it's about the message does that make yeah. sense so that's a slightly sort of Absolutely. roundabout way of, of saying it's uh you know it's not a personal thing it, the message is what's important um mm -hmm. not whether i feel you know that i should be the person standing up there saying it another question i would like to ask is yes you want to get the point across to the public but how do you evaluate success as interim deputy chief medical officer and how do you also manage to stay positive during this current pandemic mm. wow these are fantastic questions honestly these are they're making they're really making me think um evaluating success is very very hard mm. it really is 
And that's probably one of the most challenging things for me because you probably have gathered that, you know, I like to I like to do well. I like to know that I'm doing well. And when you don't have that kind of feedback, it's really difficult. I'll tell you what I what I don't do, which may or may not surprise you, is I'm not on Twitter, for example. Uh, I'm not on Facebook. And mm -hmm. that is a deliberate decision on my part um, because I um, I think, you know, an, uh, someone who would uh, potentially pour over some of the negative things. So you see, mm -hmm. when I speak to you about put yourself down, I speak from experience at least. I mm -hmm. think I would be someone who would who would concentrate too much on on those, and I'm not yet quite thick skinned enough to let some of the really terrible things that people come out and say mm -hmm. about you who don't even know you via social media nowadays. I'm not quite. Uh, I just don't want to put myself in in that position. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't look for feedback on those kinds of um, media, but and you'll laugh at this. My poor husband occasionally scans Twitter for me and tells me some of the um, some of the the good things, which is really nice. <laughs> and he also does tell me some of the things that he thinks are constructive in terms of feedback. So he doesn't just tell me all the lovely things. Don't worry, he's not <laughs> he's not that um, that bad. But um, he does sift things for me uh so that the you know the the personal ones that are really mm -hmm. unhelpful mm -hmm. the trolls um i i just i choose not not to see in the first place and i trust him to do that so i think um i also have a number of really trusted colleagues who will tell me believe me if they think i'm doing a good job or a bad job or if they think i've um got something you know right one day or spot on um and they'll also tell me if they think i can improve on something uh and i have uh people that i can go to and specifically ask them myself about that too and i do that so i think seeking feedback on your own you know your own performance is important but be careful who you ask find someone who is sensible and trusted and whose opinion you value and make sure that you're learning it's constructive mm -hmm. so that you know mm -hmm. if they are suggesting how you might improve something that it's done in in the right way so that you can take that on board but in terms of how we measure that's you know my own kind of personal performance um the other thing that we do is we do um what's called 360 degree feedback you've probably heard of this in many other settings mm -hmm. so basically you um select you know, 25, 30 people with whom you work, both inside government, outside government, and anonymously, they're all sent a questionnaire on you, and someone else analyzes all the results anonymously, it comes back, so you don't know who said what, but they get to feedback on your performance so that people can be completely honest, uh, and you, as I say, don't know who said what, so it's, you know, it's it's a very, again, a safe environment for people to to constructively say what they think. And that's, I think, a very useful tool. Um, and the true success of, of my role will be in combination with so many other people. That's that's you know, that's the other thing. Because the true success of my role will be when we get back to something relatively normal in terms of our lives. And this pandemic has, you know, gone underground and when people are not dying and when everyone is safe and well and able to see their families again. But when that success happens, believe me, I'm a tiny part, tiny part of that. And that's many, many other people. And that will, I hope, come down the line. And what motivates me to keep going is, is knowing how much I want us all to get there and that I am happy to play any part in that, that I can for all of us, including me as a citizen who's living in mm -hmm. Scotland with mm -hmm. my loved mm -hmm. ones at the moment. Yeah, thank you. And, and I think that, that sort of leads into a question really from me and a sense of what's coming um, through in, in questions from the audience that, um, you know, I think we're all excited and optimistic about, um, things opening up and um, you know I'm certainly really excited that we're going to have more pupils in school from next week um, we've already got our nursery and one to three junior um, girls here um, but but understandably you know people will have anxieties about that um, you know there may be staff watching parents watching pupils watching who perhaps whilst pleased that some 
normalities coming back to us in little ways for school they might be nervous about that what would your message be to people at home who who might be nervous about you know the, the gradual unlocking if you like um of society as we move forward first of all i completely understand um mm -hmm. any kind of change is always difficult and we've almost got to the bit where we sort of feel safer locked mm -hmm. up and the prospect of opening up can feel very frightening to people. Um, I, I completely understand that. But I think the first thing to say is, you know, we are we are doing what we think is the right thing to do at the right time. We're not doing anything rashly. We're not doing anything in a hurry. We're only doing things when we feel that clinically it's safe to do it and it's the right mm -hmm. time to do it. What we've always tried uh, with this pandemic is, you'll have heard us say this before, is this balance of harms. Yeah. in that staying locked up for the rest of our lives is so harmful we can't do that yeah. you know we'll yeah. all go absolutely mad so it's about that balance of harms the virus versus the harms that lockdown causes both for ourselves as individuals but also you know wider for society and also for the economy that has big effects that ripple out from that and we always try to open up at the right time to you know to achieve that balance and we are doing everything so very carefully we are analyzing everything that we possibly can and as we are opening up we're concentrating really hard on the things that really matter first that's why we're doing schools first because education and the continuation of education for our young people is the most important thing just now. Me getting to a restaurant or a pub doesn't matter in the global scheme of things. You know, till way down the line, we need to get our, our young people back into education. And so, you know, we're very clear about our priorities. We're doing it really, really carefully. And we're not doing it with our eyes closed. We're monitoring everything mm -hmm. and we're also monitoring things like the vaccination effect so that we yeah. know the really good effect that the vaccines are having um and so you know we're, we're we're only doing things once we've got that information that's why we were saying we have to wait we have to wait we have to wait mm -hmm. and we did mm -hmm. and we're opening up so very very gradually that we can see the effect of everything as we open it up and then yeah. give it some weeks before we do the next bit. So for some people, it might feel as if we're doing it too slowly. And I understand that too, but we're doing it in the way that we believe is the safest way possible. Mm -hmm. And we're testing lots of places. We're testing in schools. Yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're putting everything in place that we can mm -hmm. to allow people to feel safe. And if people, you know, don't agree with what we're doing or don't feel safe, you know, we want to know what we can do to try and change that. We want to know what we can do to, to try to, you know, to, to turn that around. But there's no one who is more cautious about this, actually, than, than <laughs> us. None of us are, are, are risk takers in this respect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a, I think that's a really reassuring um, answer for all of us. And obviously, um, from a school point of view, then, you know, any concerns or questions, you know, should be shared with school and, you know, we'll do what we can to explain, you know, the mitigations um, in place. So it is international. Say, schools, schools, schools have been fantastic. I should say that too. And that, you know, the schools have been amazing in terms of the, the mitigations that they've put in place. And, you know, I, I have absolutely no doubt that schools have taken their roles incredibly seriously in this pandemic and have acted you know with the best interests of the, the pupils always trying to protect the pupils and their and their staff and, and the rightly staff, so yeah. because mm -hmm. it's a, it's an essential you know function of our society it's an essential institution but schools mm -hmm. have been amazing and have cooperated with us in terms of everything that we have asked mm -hmm. them to do the whole way along you know, we're all on the same side here, and that's really important in this sector too. So I'm sorry Absolutely. to interrupt, but I didn't need to give no, you no. the uh, that's, credit that's where really, it's due. Yeah, thank you. And um, yeah, we're absolutely we're all on the on the same side. And you know, this is we're in, we're moving into the next phase of this, and you know, we're looking forward to um, getting stuck in. Lots more people coming to collect their lateral flow tests today, and uh, it's all it's all moving forward. So I was just going to say that you know this is International Women's Day, and it's a uh, different International Women's Day, no doubt, to some. But I just wondered who are the women who have inspired you in your life? Because you're inspiring us tonight. And who's inspired you? 
Gosh, well, when I first went to university, there weren't very many uh, women in very senior positions in medicine. I'm not sure how long ago it was that I went to university. Um, and uh, I remember there was one female consultant. I can, you know, there was only, I think, the one female consultant in the in all the sort of rotations that I went through as a as a medical student. And um, her name was Professor Joan Trowell, and uh, she was mm -hmm. fabulously terrifying. Honestly, she was she was absolutely terrifying and wonderful and so uh, you know intellectually uh, just as inspiring. I could never have hoped to even be like her. But certainly, when I saw her in a very male-dominated world, just doing her thing and being so strong and so powerful, um, I, she really did inspire me to think that that you know women could could do it just as well as men could and in, in a medical specialty and be right at the, the top of their tree. Um, and I think that's you know that's had a really lasting effect on me certainly as a yeah. student. Mm -hmm. And in my working career, I've got to say I I have met so many amazing women. And in Scottish government at the moment, we are so fortunate. We have fabulous women at all levels in Scottish government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our chief nursing officer who's about to retire, Professor Fiona McQueen, is yeah. an absolute icon. Um, I'm very fortunate in that also our interim chief pharmaceutical officer, Alison Strath, is a joy to work with, an absolute joy. And our uh, our current director general of the NHS is the first female director general of the NHS in Scotland, Caroline Lamb, and she is just like no one I've ever met before in terms of her her brain, her ability, her work ethic, um, and that's just to name a few. I am surrounded in Scottish government by fabulous women. I really am, and and they continue to inspire me um every day uh you know it just it lifts us all i think when mm -hmm. we support each other mm -hmm. when we're mm -hmm. uh, you know a a good a good combination of of strong women all playing to the strengths and, and working together so i as i say i think I, i've been really fortunate to have some very good role models as i've as i've gone through and uh International Women's Day. I have actually texted many of them today to thank them, believe it or not. So oh, that's that's lovely that you've done that. Well, I mean, you're talking about role models. We think role models are really important at St Margaret's, and um, you have been just an absolutely fantastic role model um, for us today, not just for our pupils, but I think to everybody um, who's watching you. Your honesty, your commitment to what you're doing, um, and this very genuine sense of serving the country um, during this pandemic has just shone through. And I know that you will be inspiring some of our pupils to um, really you know, remember what their dreams are and to follow them with all their hearts. So thank you so much for, for giving um, of your time tonight when I'm sure there are very many other things um, that you could be doing. And uh, I, I know that Jewel will have enjoyed this too. Thank you, Jewel, as well for, for being with us. And I imagine you'd like to say something too. On behalf of the St. Margaret's School community, I would like to express my sincere thanks to Dr. Steedman for taking time out of her busy schedule to speak to us. It has been incredibly inspiring to hear from you. And I know that every, everyone watching has found this very beneficial too. I would also like to thank Ms. Tomlinson and all the supportive teachers at school for giving me this wonderful opportunity. Mm -hmm. Finally, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to the members of the public watching this webinar at home too. Thank you. Thank you, Jewel. And we'd like to say thank you again to Aberdeen Standard Capital who are supporting um, this series. And um, we, we've got more in the series to come. And um, our next speaker is going to be Mary Contini, who's a best-selling author, food writer and um, Scottish chef. Oh, how I wish that I could be eating her food tonight. <laughs> Those restaurants will come again, Dr. Stephen, won't they? <laughs> but um, I hope so. Absolutely. But for tonight, um, I think in our homes and in our school, we're joining together for a big round of applause um, for Dr. Stephen. And um, we wish you and all your colleagues really well as you continue with your work over the coming months. And we're all very much behind you. So thank you very much indeed for joining us.
and good night to everybody at home. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been a pleasure. I just want to talk to you today about how important I think it is for girls and young women to be ambitious about your futures. Never think that you'll be stopped from doing what you want to do because you're a female, but actually go out there, have a vision for what you want to do. We need to see more women in business, more women in politics, more women succeeding across our society because we need women's different expertise and background. We need that diversity because with that diversity come better decisions. So aspire, aspire to be your best. Do your best to achieve what you want to achieve. I know there'll be barriers in your way, but overcome those barriers. Never think that you can't do something because you're a woman. Go out there and show what women can do. to everyone at St Margaret's School for Girls. First of all, congratulations to all of the staff and pupils who've been inspiring women for 175 years and obviously continue to do so. I wanted all of you to know that there is no dream too big or too small and you have to make the most of opportunities that come your way as you just don't know where they might take you. I never imagined I would one day be hosting my own show on national TV. But you know what, there's no shortcuts. You have to put in the graft. You've got to be prepared for bumps along the way. And then when that happens, pick yourself up again. I've got a drawer full of rejection letters from the BBC, but I just kept applying for jobs until, well, they decided to take me on as a researcher. I went from BBC Scotland to Breakfast Telly in 1984, and I've been there ever since. I still, to this day, I do my homework every night. I go through my research and I think long and hard about what I'm going to ask guests, whether it's the Prime Minister or a contestant in a reality show. You have to put in the work. You've got to volunteer to do whatever is needed and above all, treat everybody with respect. You're going to get out into the world and people are going to listen to what you say. So be kind, be confident and aim to go out there and make a positive difference through whatever you choose to do. I'm already really impressed by your passion for raising money and helping both international causes and those closer to home. And I hope that you keep that dedication to helping others as you leave school and move on to become successful and I hope happy women. So go out there and make a difference. Mm -hmm.